What's up, everybody? Welcome to the first video in a new series I'm doing, uh, which is sort of on the basics of computer engineering. Uh, the purpose, the reason I'm doing it is because I was sort of working on another tutorial series, which I'm continuing to do, but I wanted to, uh, I was talking about like the compilation process and sort of why it's important or why it's necessary to compile code. And I realized that there's a lot of stuff going on uh, underneath the hood of the computer that's not necessarily, that's sort of tangential to a, to a tutorial that's strictly how to program, but it is sort of nice to know and I think will help to, um, would help someone become a better programmer, but it's a, a little bit of a separation of concern, so I thought maybe it would be best to address all that stuff in a separate video series, which is what I'm doing um, today. So this series is computer engineering, right, which is, in my mind, sort of bridging the gap between electrical engineering over here and, uh, you know, software engineering over here, or computer science, perhaps. Uh, and electrical engineering is sort of all the hardware stuff, right? Transistors and what have you, and a lot of physics because they're moving actual electrons around and doing that kind of thing. Computer science is a lot more sort of higher level abstractions. Uh, it's a lot of math, but it is kind of like language processing, different kind of stuff. So computer engineering is sort of a little bit of both. It's kind of a happy medium. So you know, I'm by no means the top expert in the field of computer engineering. I'm not, strictly speaking, even a computer engineer, right? I'm more of a software type dude. But I do think it's interesting, and I try to learn what I can. And a lot of the examples that I'm going to be um, going over in this series are coming from this book called Code, which I've read, and I highly suggest to anyone who's interested in this kind of thing, because it's very well written. The guy Charles Petzold is a technical writer and also an engineer. Uh, he's written a lot of books that are like more on more advanced topics. This one was more of a uh, a labor of love, so to speak. He wanted to sort of expand knowledge about computers generally. So it's it's very much written for a beginner, and it's uh, very good. And uh, hopefully, this video series is more than just a book report on my favorite book and I have some something else to add to it as well which I think I you know kinda do and it's nice to draw pictures sometimes right so anyway um, this video is going to be about Morse code Morse code and Morse code is not a particularly relevant language today I don't think there's any computer systems out there that are currently using Morse code, uh, maybe some like Navy stuff or something, I don't know, but <laughs> uh, the reason that it is important historically in the history of computers generally is that it was the first language that was written specifically to go to um, be delivered over an electrical device. In this instance, the I don't know why I drew an eye right there, but <laughs> it has nothing to do with eyes. Uh, but it does. It was written for the telegraph, right? So back in the day, which was a Wednesday, we had this um, new device called the telegraph, and I'll go over how the telegraph works, like from an electrical standpoint, later. But from a language um, like communications perspective. We've got a guy over here on this end, we've got a guy over here on this end, and we've got this wire going through. And it wasn't like a telephone line where you can send your own voice over the telephone, right? It was just a very primitive electrical signal that's going across here. So it's kind of like a light switch, like you can send a signal across and you can like do something on the other end, like you can light up a light or one of the more popular ways to, 
to send signals on the telegraph was they had like a little buzzer on the other end, right? And you could send a signal and it would make the buzzer make a noise, like me, right? So <laughs> I don't know what that is, but uh, so like if you watch like old timey movies or movies that are set in old timeies, right? Like sometimes they're in like a telegraph room. It's like beep, 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 right? That's the telegraph. That's a signal coming over the telegraph. But obviously beep, 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 beep is not a human readable language, right? Like we don't know what that means. So that's where Morse comes in, Samuel Morse, uh, this guy, uh, his stunning visage there. He was a mathematician, I believe, uh, who invented Morse code, obviously, because it's named after him. Uh, and he came up with a, a, a combination of different signals, and he used two different signals what I'm going to refer to from here on out as dots and dashes because that's how they're commonly written but essentially a dot was a short signal and a dash was a long signal so using different combinations of short signals and long signals he would um, send you know specific letters over the telegraph and you might be saying well why would he use two different uh, symbols. Why would he use two different signals? That could be confusing, right? Like you might not know, was that long enough to be a dash or was that was that a dot, right? Why not just use one signal and just send like, you know, one signal is an A, two signals is a B, three signals is a C, etc. Well, that sounds great, but you can quickly see like what if you want to send a Z, right? Like are we going to send 26 signals just to send one letter? And then what about the poor guy on the other end who has to decode all this stuff, right? Like, he's like, oh, shit, was that a 21 symbols or 20, 22? I, I lost count. Like, could you send that whole message again, right? Like, just sending the word telegraph would take forever. But Morris was a mathematician, and he knew a little bit about combinations, right? Combinations. That's not great. But he knew a little bit about combinations, and he knew that if he used two different types of symbols instead of just one signal, right, if he used two, that's a dot, a dot and a dash, then he would be able to represent all these letters with much less, like, number of things to, to represent one letter, right? So I'm going to show you sort of how that works. So he started with saying, like, maybe I just want to send one symbol, right? Either a dot or a dash. And in this case, a dot represented an E, and a dash represented a T. So if you got a dot over the telegraph, you knew that was an E. And if you got a dash over the telegraph, you knew that was a T. But that's only two letters, right? So that's not super useful, unless you're talking about your favorite movie, right? Um, we have to. We have what 24 more letters to go. So what do we do? Well, he started adding columns. So we can think of this as sort of one column, right? Like one column here. We'll put it lines. Hopefully that's clear what I'm trying to do. Uh, if you only have one symbol, if you have two combination, two symbols, but you only have one, you only sent, are able to send one thing. Right, you can only represent two possible possibilities. Either it's a dot or it's a dash. But what if you have two columns? Right? If you have a, two columns, then you can send a dot dot or a dot dash or a dash dot or a dash dash. And in this case, a dash dash is an I and a or a dot dot is an I, sorry. A dot dash is an A. That's an A. A dash dot is an N, and a dash dash is an M. So now we've got four more letters that we represented. And that's kind of interesting to look at because all we did was we added one more column, yet we went from two to four. So we added one, we went plus one over here, but we went times two over here. We doubled the total number of combinations uh, that we could use. So now we've got six letters, but we've got 20 more to go. So <laughs> we've got to add another column, 
right? So let's say we have three columns. Well, we can do a dot, 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 a dot, dot, dash, a dot, dash, dot, dot, dash, dash. I'm going to running out of space here. A dash, dot, dot, dash, dot, dash, a dash, dash, dot, and a dash, dash, dash. And I'm not going to write the letters next to them because it doesn't really matter what letters we're representing, what we're really interested in is how many letters can we represent. And we can see here that we've added one more column, so we did plus one over here. The total number of combinations that we now have is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So again, we've doubled the total number of combinations we can represent by simply adding one more column. And I'm not going to do four. I'm not going to do four columns. But if you don't believe me, you can do it yourself, right? But if you go from four dots all the way down to four dashes, right, you will find that this is 16 combinations. So we've added another column, and then we have again doubled the total number of uh, combinations that we can make. And that's useful because now if we add everything up, right, we've got two letters plus four letters is six, plus eight letters is 14, plus 16 letters is 30. So we have uh, successfully represented all of our letters, and we even have a few left over for, uh, I guess, punctuation or whatever. And actual true Morse code ends up using five. There's use, use case for up to five uh, columns because we have to be able to represent numbers, and there's like some different letters for different languages and stuff like that. So it ends up being a total of five, but still five is a lot better than 26 to get a Z, right? So using this sort of combination system is pretty smart, but it also gives us a little bit of insight into binary because binary because what we have is we have a, a dot and a dash and nowadays in modern computers we have a zero and a one and these are different uh, symbols obviously but the concept is the same because what we find is that the number of symbols that we have ends up representing our base and the number of columns that we have ends up representing our exponent because remember we had two four eight sixteen and four is also equal to two times two and eight is also equal to two times two times two and sixteen is also equal to two times I'm getting all excited and I'm, I'm writing shitty so I apologize for that but two times two times two right which is also equal to two squared two cubed and two to the fourth. So I'm writing that kind of, oh, and then of course two to the one is just two, right? Two one times is, is two. So what we see, and this was when we had one column, this was when we had two columns, three columns, and four columns. So what we see is that our our number of possible symbols that we can have, whether it be a dot and a dash or a zero and a one, is going to represent our base. And then the number of columns, the number of times, the number of symbols that we have in a row is going to represent our exponent. So if we have uh, only one symbol, then we can only have two possible possibilities. But if we have two symbols, then we can have two possibilities for column one, and then two more possibilities for column two, and those multiply together to give us four possibilities. Uh, that's not a nine, by the way, that's a four. It multiplies together to give us four possibilities, otherwise known as two squared. And that becomes important for the future of computer science uh, as we continue going along, like two to the fifth is gonna end up being 32, and two to the sixth is gonna end up being 64, and then 2 to the 7 is going to end up being 128, and then 2 to the 8 is going to end up being 
52, 56, and so on. And we will see these numbers again and again uh, as we continue. So that's an interesting factoid about Morse code. Uh, it gives you the basic idea of how it's used. And there's one more sort of interesting tidbit that I want to go over about Morse code. But I am kind of, this video is getting a little long, so I think I'm going to throw it in a separate video where I'm going to sort of go over um, some of the difficulties with receiving Morse code when you're trying to, like, figure out what somebody's sending you and some of the ways that they uh, came up with to figure out that stuff. All right. Bye.